Are, are we live? Yes, we are live! Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to a classic Saturday stream, where, as you can tell, today we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Ooh, welcome back, everybody. How's everybody out there doing? Alkaby, Blinty Boy, I see you guys are here. Marcel, you're being rather active in the chat today. How's everybody feeling? How's everyone's weekends going? And who's excited for the next part in our story? Ah. Uh, oh, if I could just say, interesting day for me today so far. Just got back from the Rite Aid and got myself the uh, first shot of the vaccine, so... My arm's being a little sore on me. It shouldn't be a big problem, though. And I'm excited to get into Dungeons & Dragons. Hopefully I don't start feeling bad or having to deal with any major issues. But we should be good. I've heard the first dosage tends not to be bad at all. Any nightmares after Fatalis, Eric? Mm, I would say any nightmares, no. No, I got up this morning, went into the Guiding Lands, and got myself a little more grinding running. I think I'm I'm just going to have to keep pushing up my stats little by little, and eventually I'll be able to knock them down. And that is the goal for me over the week, is to, is to just get through that first part of Fatalis, so that I can finally call in some help, and we can all see the end of this, so that we can start on the next game. One, I'm a lot more confident in my abilities to play until I start giving you all a bit more influence over me. I was home all weekend. Nothing special. All right, Alkaby. Hey, good for you. Which shot you get? I think it's the, what is it, Pfizer? Uh, the one with the P. You know. Uh, I wish you a swift recovery after the vaccine. Thank you, Blinty. Thank you, thank you. Now then, with that, let's get ourselves set up in our little story time room. Oh no, one of my little tests, one of my little tests I was running earlier today was visible for a second there, but we got everything cleaned up. Just a small amount of scuff, and maybe it's just a teaser. Me trying to get people uh, excited. Oh, don't worry, Sour Cake, we haven't fully got into it. I was just wishing everybody a happy Saturday. Getting all of my notes and everything arranged and ready for a good and happy story time. So, let's see. Is everybody sitting comfortably? Is the fire warm enough for all of you? I hope so. Because where we left off, things were about to become... Very dark and dangerous for the party. Eric using his sniper before the stream. Hey, hey, hey. Everybody loves just a little bit of ska. Yep, see, Spring's in there with me. Now then, I suppose we'll start with just a little bit of a recap. During my last stream, we began the latest arc for the party. We all have to shoulder. Hmm. Gotcha. That is where they got me, isn't it? Right in the shoulder. Oh, well. During our last stream, the party had completed their first real job and task as presented to them by someone. Delivering the diplomats from Arena to Corella. And they made it without... Too much issue. An ambush in the mountains, some arguments between the party members, being accosted by the wood elves in the Ethorial Valley. The party made it through it all and managed to arrive in Corella with their diplomats fully intact. They brought them and were granted their rewards and asked if there was anything they would like from the Lady Aquila Andrana. The majority of the party just accepted a small bonus to their pay, except for the halfling bard, 
Milo under the bridge. He instead chose to play on the favor and to gain a permanent position with Aquila and Ramus as an assistant to their diplomatic work in Corella. He would be forever leaving the party to join a world of the elves, the nobility, and the peace of living within the palace. The rest of the party would have to learn to live without Milo accompanying them from that point on. And perhaps as a distraction, or simply as it's always the next step for an adventuring party, they searched the town for the next job and found a mission to find a missing student who had disappeared somewhere in the nearby woods, deep within the Ethereal Valley. The party questioned her professors, her friends, and were able to gather a small bit of information that would guide them out to the border between Eothen and Ethoriel. Here they would make camp in a small village that they had stopped by on their way to Corella, and plot their scouting of the land. While here they would learn that the party they had after was made of three people, a young student woman accompanied by two rough-looking guards. They had bought some food and taken their wagon into the woods. Not too deep, they suspect, and were able to narrow down the area they would search. The party, too, would encounter the children of this village, particularly the wood elf monk Tortuga, where he would quickly learn he despises the children of this village. Now then, gathering what information they had, and after their first day of searching turned up fruitless, the party moves in for their second day of scouting out the woods. On this day, however, Pharaoh makes a new choice to assist with the scouting. While Malachite leads the party on land, showing them the terrain, while Tortuga makes his quick moves and natural feeling for the woods to dart about, allowing them to widen their view quite a bit. Pharaoh makes a new choice and decides to fly overhead of the party, searching left and right for any sign of what might have befallen a student to leave her out in the woods so long, perhaps spying a camp or some smoke rising from the trees. High in the air, in a distant clearing, Pharaoh does see something. A glint of light that flashes for a moment, then is gone. As she watches the clearing, she sees it occur again. The first solid sign of something out in those woods that isn't some animal. Pharaoh flies down to the party and points them in the direction of the clearing where she believes she saw this glowing light for just a moment. The party cuts in that direction, moving through the thick woods until they arrive at a strange partial clearing. Still, a few trees dot the area as they arrive on the outskirts of it. In the very center, they see a floating orb of pale blue light sat there bobbing slowly up and down. As the first party member steps into the clearing, though, it disappears, seeming to extinguish the light in an instant. Everyone stops and glances about. And suddenly the orb of light appears again, in between two of the trees within this small cleared area. They see it bobbing up and down, where these trees seem to form themselves into an arch-like structure. The party begins creeping forward as a second light, a little distance away, comes into view and begins slowly bobbing up and down. These two motes of light seeming to watch the party as they slowly walk into the open. After a moment's hesitation, 
The closest light, the one between the two trees, begins bobbing more energetically and slowly darting back and forth from one side of the tree archway to the other, beckoning the party closer. Evening, Xenoku. Watching the light, Pharaoh quickly states to the party that she thinks it wants them to follow it. Though they're all frozen in nervousness. Strange lights in the woods are always a uh, reason to hesitate. And perhaps these are the things that made the student disappear. But as they seem to be moving back and forth under this archway of three trees, Tortuga slowly creeps his way forward. The remainder of the party on guard, on edge, waiting for anything to go wrong. Tortuga slowly approaches the light, as for a last time it darts backwards through the archway of trees. It seems to bob there, beckoning him to cross the threshold. Looking about, Tortuga takes a deep breath and takes a single step between the archway of trees. And at first, nothing happens. He simply steps between some trees. But then, the rustling begins. The cracking of root, twig, and branch. His eyes slowly tilt upwards. As a creature made of thorns and vines drops from the tree cover and lands immediately next to him, lashing out with its vine-thorned arms, trying to capture Tortuga. As the party draws it we its weapons and begin moving forward, all the trees around the clearing begin to rustle as well, as many more of these thorned vine-like creatures, vine blights, cursed elemental beings begin emerging from the trees and the coverage around and moving towards the party. Amongst them are four large bestial looking plant elementals. Thornies. Creatures covered in wooden spikes that leak a thick sap able to heal even the most dire of wounds. It seems this is what the Will-o'-the-Wisps has been guiding the party towards. Malicious little creatures. Not all know, but Will-o'-the-Wisps are in fact undead beings and not Feyan in origin. They are the souls of long-dead creatures that died torturous deaths. They hang around in dark, cursed, and dangerous places to try and taunt and tempt other beings into them for the sole purpose of feeding on their last moments, on their tragedy and pain, and sucking away what life remains, and the fools who follow lights into the wood. However, the party has no time to worry about lore or dark stories of the elves and the undead. They are fully ambushed. As the thornies move to create a front line, the vine blights begin lashing out from a distance, binding up party members, causing roots and thorn to dig up and catch them. The fight is desperate and dire, but the first fatal blow is delivered to a thorny. Its spikes dig into Perch's hand as he brings down his maul, cracking its skull in pieces. But as the sap scatters about, they begin slowly pulling the plant's skull back into place, reshaping it and bringing it back to life. It seems the thornies can even revive from death if they are not burnt to cinders. But unfortunately for the party, they do not have fire magic available to them. With only a cleric, a ranger, a shade, and a monk, their options are limited. The vine blights 
staying at range become a serious issue. Their damage is not lethal, at least not in the beginning, but as they're able to slowly work members of the party down over time, even the heavily armored perch begins to feel the pain. The thornies rising from the dead again and again seems to become an almost impossible challenge. But then perch strikes one down for the second time. And as it starts to rise up again, a glowing orb of light appears over top of it. As Perch watches the light, he begins to hear deadly whispers, cruel incantations, the soul of the being that had made this wisp speaking to the dying creature at its feet, draining the life energy from it. As Perch watches, the rising thorny begins to drain like a plant deprived of water. It crumbles to ash. The moat of light floats over top of the ashed corpse, then disappears. The Perch can feel its air, its energy moving about, looking for the next thing it can drain. He calls out to the party, the wisps, they can, they can kill the thornies. We have to drop them when a wisp is near. The whole party nods, though at this stage everyone is quite thoroughly wounded. They begin working with the wisps that they can see occasionally, trying to judge where they are and guessing their positioning to make sure they can drop a thorny right in front of one of them. And one by one, the thornies fall and are drained away by the will of the wisps. But the party is on its last legs. With very little health left to them, Pharaoh looks about and realizes she has no choice left to her. She reaches into her bag to grab an item she has not held aloft since she left her home. The sigil of her god. From her bag, Pharaoh produces a small sigil, an item crafted from a white marble veined in dark red veins, giving it a pink hue all over. The image of a skull ringed in red droplets of blood. Pharaoh offers up a prayer to her god to grant her and her friends strength so that they may slay what lies before them. As she holds her sigil aloft, an energy fills the woods, a dark, cruel, blood-hungry energy. Red petals begin to materialize and fall from the sky, and as each petal falls onto one of her party members, some of their life is regained, their strength restored, but it is all accompanied by a dark voice in the back of all their minds as it leans in and whispers a single word, INFLICT. As the dark energy pulls back, the party finds themselves dominantly revived, not back to full health in any state, but in much better straits than they were before. But the voice burns in the back of Tortuga's mind as he drops a thorny next to him. The last one, he watches as the will-o'-the-wisp materializes over the creature. Inflict. Inflict. It echoes in the back of his mind. And as the thorny is reduced to ash, Tortuga lashes out with a single fist and strikes the will-o'-the-wisp. He can feel its energy part around his fist, and he knows it is wounded as it draws back for a moment. It seems to stare at him for a second as he hears the deathly whispers and cruel incantations of it grow silent. And an energy grows in its center, 
as an electric charge is sent out and strikes Tortuga, dropping him instantly. Tortuga falls unconscious, and the will of the wisp begins to slowly drift over top of him. The whole party turns as they watch the wisp begin to drain the life from Tortuga. If it is allowed to absorb his soul, that will be the end forever. The party dashes into action. The last few vine blights are made quick work of. Without their thorny guardians to protect them, they are easily killed. Pharaoh runs to Tortuga. She's entirely out of spells and cannot heal him, so she grabs him and begins dragging him, trying to create some distance from the wisp, but it maintains, growing closer and closer. Malachite draws and knocks an arrow, takes a shot at the wisp. In response, the wisp goes invisible. It will not have its torturous meal interrupted. All that's left is Perch. He takes a position between where the wisp was and where his new compatriot is. Perch closes his eyes and holds his maul in both hands. He reels back and waits for a moment. As a recognizable voice speaks to him, the man who has been with him his entire life. Oh, come on. You can feel the air moving. You know exactly where it is. And with that, Perch lashes out, slamming his hammer down with all strength, cutting through the empty air in front of him, until, halfway through his swing, the clearing is filled with the sound of shattering glass. His hammer struck the invisible will-o'-the-wisp true and shattered it into a soft golden dust that slowly fell to the ground. With all of their energy drained, with their health and lives right at the brink, everyone collapses and spends some time licking their wounds and trying to put themselves together. Pharaoh is the first to rise again she moves over to the pile of will-o'-the-wisp ash and gathers it into a small vial she had, saving it away for a rainy day. You never know when that might come of use. She then crosses to one of the thorny corpses, these creatures that were able to heal themselves even from the brink of death. She reaches down and trails a claw through the thick sap draining from the corpse and slowly applies it to one of her wounds, and watches, open-mouthed, as the small cut begins to slowly seal and heal itself. Tortuga is roused eventually as the party begins applying the sap to all their open wounds, thorn-struck bodies, and electrical injuries. They're able to put themselves back together. But as they search the clearing, they find no sign of the missing student. It seemed this was simply a trap laid by a dark spirit that was now finally dealt with. With no more energy to continue their search for the day, and with no signs here of where the girl had gone, the party gathers up their gear and returns back to the village. Another day gone. And Hannah, still unfound. They are relieved with having survived this ordeal, one of the hardest fights they had had in their lives. But tomorrow they'll be going into the woods again, and simply hoping that their next sweep will be more productive than this. The next morning comes and the party departs from their camp. There's only one more section before they'll begin overlapping tomorrow with the two helpers they have from the village. Today there is search an overgrown area of the woods, one that is ancient, more ancient than any other section 
this close to the border between the valley and the forest. Malachite guards the party as they spend their morning in their similar search patterns trying to find any sign. And then Malachite sees it. A tree with a section of wood stripped from it. Bark had been removed so that the ancient wood underneath could have a single long strip carved from it. Exactly the amount of wood she would expect someone would need if they were beginning the crafting of a magic wand. The party knows that Hannah was out here trying to experiment or create something. Something to help her subvert some of the rules of magic. And with this ancient wood being used in a wand, perhaps that was the first step that she needed. The party quickly gathers here, around the tree, and begins searching outwards, fanning. They find other old trees with small strips of wood taken from them, and eventually they find an old wagon trail where a large vehicle had blown through the underbrush. It's over a week old at this stage, but still cramped down enough that it gives them something to follow. The party falls into a tracking step, begins moving, cutting eastward across the woods, following this old trail. When in the distance, they begin to hear a rustling in the woods. They all drop to their knees as Tortuga and Malachite creep forward, the stealthiest of the four. They look out ahead of them, and through the woods, they see the elven forester, the man who had been helping them to search the woods, who had organized the elders to speak with them. They see him looking about, seemingly discovering the next portion of the trail they had been following. They quickly make themselves known, and with a start, the man turns around and asks them what they're doing here. He thought they were searching a little further west. They explain that they had found a trail leading from an ancient part of the woods through here, and the man explains that he had found a trail at this point that seemed to continue eastward and was about to begin following it. But if it had cut that far, then this is definitely the sign of where the student had gone. The party asked him how much he had explored. He said he had just found it here, but that before that, he had seen something a little disturbing. Much deeper in the woods, it seems, there is a group of princeling elven hunters from the authorial traveling about the woods right now. A similar group to the ones that had accosted the party for a traveling tax. One, Lee Feyenil. Tortuga remembers him well. The encounter was unpleasant. And the party states they'd like to avoid any encounter with any authorial elves it can, if it could be helped. The forester nods as he begins guiding them along the trail that they had all begun to follow. It cuts eastward for a while before eventually cutting a little deeper into the woods. As they move along the trail, they come to an area where the trees begin to grow further apart. An old area where much of the undergrowth has been deprived of light by the high canopies, creating a much easier walking condition. They follow a well-trotted trail. It seems that the trio that had been out there had been moving about gathering stuff along this path for a long time before they suddenly stopped a few weeks ago. As they continue, the party eventually stops, with Malachite at their head, frozen, staring into the next portion of the woods. She holds up a hand, getting the whole party to cease their movements. She then falls to her knees and, symbol, and signs for the party to be silent. As everyone gathers close, they ask Malachite what's wrong. Everyone begins looking in the forest dead ahead of them. They can see nothing that has stopped Malachite's movement. Then she points through the trees to a distant, strange shape, a clump of white that seems to be 
standing between two trees, stationary, almost like a giant grub, it seems to simply sit there. Well, what is that? Tortuga asks Malachite. As they watch, Malachite gives a deep sigh, draws an arrow, knocks it, and fires it across the woods into the standing white shape. The whole party watches as it seems to not react at all to the arrow that struck into it. But then the leaves in a nearby tree to the shape begin to rustle. And two large, hairy appendages slowly begin descending from the tree, gripping to some invisible cord as they climb down. A massive forest spider descends to its cocoon. It begins tapping on it, trying to figure out how its meal had begun to move again after being wrapped. Finding it still and dead, the massive spider begins retreating back up into the giant tree, satisfied that its web is not disturbed and its meal is going nowhere. With that, the party begins looking about at all the canopies that block out the light. They begin to realize what had seemed like cottony seeds, willowy appendages, or massive balls of web stringing across the trees. Looking about, they see one web, two, a nest, another, dozens. This entire section of the wood seems to be claimed by over a dozen giant spiders. And as everyone glances around, Pharaoh points through the trees to a distant object, a wagon, sat in the middle of a space near a burnt tree, and a pair of feet hanging off its side. I believe that is the wagon we are looking for. The party nods, draws their weapons and prepares themselves. It seems Hannah and her guards got themselves into this area of the forest. Whether looking for a campsite or to gather materials is unclear, but something definitely went wrong. And now these spiders have the area claimed fully for themselves. A maze of webs interlock between many of the trees in the area. The party begins gathering themselves, the Tortuga taking a lead. They begin to creep through the woods, trying to make their way to the wagon. They could just find out what's happening and then get out of this space without tripping any of the webbing. They should be fine. But it was not to be. As Dortuga begins passing by a section of web, he feels a slight pull on his cloak. A single thread, it seems, had caught on and was adhering to his clothing tightly. In a moment, Tortuga grabs his cloak and gives it a yank, expecting himself to be able to pull clear of the web. But as he yanks, one of his feet gives out underneath him, and he slips and falls, entangling himself into the webbing. As the web pulls tight around its new prey, the massive spider descends immediately from the treetops and sinks its fangs into Tortuga, injecting him with a poison, before immediately one of the monk's trained fists catches the creature in its eye and one of its many eyes ruptures instantly, causing it to reel back. 
their chances of stealth aside, the party descends, hacking about at the spider as it tries to retreat up into the trees. It lashes out twice more, eventually sinking its fangs into perch, but as the poison is pumped from them into his system, perch seems to shrug it off without any issue at all. Unbeknownst to the party, poison has never been much of an issue for him. Eventually, the first of the beasts is slain. And as the party looks out, they see none of the other spiders have reacted. The plan for stealthing through the woods has changed. There's a new plan. Sure, there might be six or so spiders between them and their target, but they only have to fight them one at a time. Perhaps that is the best option. Over the course of the next 15 minutes or so, the party moves through one web after another, fighting giant spider after giant spider. Now, prepared for the fight to occur, they are not caught in the ambush of the webbing, instead triggering the spider to descend from the canopies and engaging in a rather quick and vicious fight, where five opponents versus one almost always results in a quick kill at worst, with one or two bites being delivered to the party in response. Eventually, the party clears their way through the woods and arrives at the abandoned campsite of Hannah and her guards. Here they find an old wagon sat here, moss beginning to grow up its wheels, wood beginning to age, and in the back, a single loaded corpse. The party fans out this clearing to search for clues, but the first one sits before them. It seems this is one of the guards, a strange fellow with shaggy beard, laid out in the back of the wagon, a weapon in hand. Across his stomach they see two puncture marks, tainted a dark green, with many of his veins black and showing all about. He's been dead for a while now, and the smell is putrid as his bloated body sits. It's clear the man was killed by being bitten by a spider. Well, not killed instantly. He was bitten and seemed to have made his way into the wagon to get some cover from them, but then eventually slowly succumbed to the poison in his system, dying here. Searching about, the party finds an old campfire, some abandoned supplies, including some food and odds and ends of the components that the group had been gathering. But then the party collectively approaches the major feature of this area. A single tall burnt tree, a standing column of charcoal the single charred skeleton at its base. Spending some time, the party searches this corpse and finds clutched in its hands an unmarred river stone. It seems that this is Hannah, and the stone clutched in her hands is the lucky stone given to her by her friend Cynthia. Looking about, they find Ash has gathered in a ring tightly around the burnt skeleton. And as one of them approaches some of the old webbing, they light up a torch and hold it out and watch as the webbing goes up in a quick inferno, burning out in almost an instant, and small bits of ash drip down to the ground. Seems Hannah had been captured by a spider at some point and wrapped in a cocoon against the base of this tree to be fed on at some later point. But the young witch had other ideas in mind and attempted to burn her way out of her imprisonment. Unluckily for her, though, it seems the inferno got out of hand and she was unable to quell it before both herself and the tree were consumed by the flames.
Finally, they see another cocoon, about human-sized, caught up in a web on the other side of the clearing. And as Tortuga approaches it, he sees on the ground beneath the cocoon is a single wooden lockbox. Reaching carefully through it, Tortuga retrieves the lockbox and holds it up for the party to see. They gather around and eventually find a key abandoned in the wagon and to open it up. Inside are several manuscripts, pieces of parchment with advanced magical runes and insignias across it, designs laid out for several different implements. It seems there was a plan for a wand and a strange leather strap that Hannah had been working on. Some of the ingredients are listed including the webbing of a giant spider. But, unfortunately for the party, the manuscripts are written so complexly and in such great detail that they're unable to decipher them at this time and know little more than the fact that these were Hannah's, were Hannah's notes, her designs for the two major magical artifacts she was trying to design. Underneath all the manuscripts, though, they find a slender wand, dark purple, its handle seemingly covered in a velvet-like material. Though as a finger brushes over it, they realize the handle is in fact covered in a thick mesh of a spider web, granting it a comfortable and adherent grip. It seems... Hannah had been at least slightly successful in her designs. The party places the wand back in the box with the manuscripts that they cannot decipher. Looking about at the three corpses, they come to a decision to bring them out of the woods, either to bring them back to Corella as proof of what had happened, or to at least give them a more proper burial in the village. <laughs> the bloated corpse of the man who had been bitten but escaped from the spiders is left on the wagon. As the cocoon filled with the empty husk of his guardian friend is cut open, the husk removed and placed on the wagon beside him. Finally, the party takes some time to gather up all the charred remains of Hannah, placing her inside a crate in the wagon. They then take heave and begin moving their way out of the woods, being guided by the forester. It takes the better half of the afternoon where the party is able to eventually emerge from the woods with the three corpses alongside them. Returning to the village, the forester explains to the elders and all that the student and her guards were found, and unfortunately that they had died. Many condolences are offered from the village to the adventurers, seemingly thinking there was some deeper connection here. The party, though, accepts them, and spends an evening with the village, accepting condolences, sharing dinner, and eventually gathering themselves up to leave in the morning. As the corpses are brought together, though, the party finds themselves in a debate. Tortuga looks down at the dead people and states that he wants to bring them back to Corella. They deserve to be brought back to their friends or family or whatever and to be given a proper burial. Though the stinking corpse of the bloated man is a bit of an issue all the other party members refuse to carry him and don't want to stick him in the back of their wagon as the conversation becomes more and more heated tortuga finds himself growing to rage the people he's with will not provide this man with the dignity of being brought home because he stinks, because his corpses 
unsanitary. His mind goes back to his home. The choking smoke, his father's head rolling towards him. Tortuga explodes at the party, saying if they really will not spare any energy for this poor dead man, then perhaps he'll just take care of it himself. They're free to leave. He'll finish off the rest of this adventure on his own. The party grows quiet, staring at the infuriated Tortuga. As a voice cuts through the night behind them, well, it seems I arrived back just in time for a good row. What are you all arguing about? Rasmussen, having returned from his business over the border, had caught the party just at the tail end of their adventure, as he rolls into camp to find them arguing over a bunch of corpses. The student and her guards that they had been sent to find. Rasmussen finds it unfortunate that none of them were found alive, but his arrival is able to break tension at least somewhat, though Tortuga finds himself still stewing a bit in his anger. Eventually, Pharaoh offers up a spell that she can cast in the morning that'll prevent the rotting man from decomposing any further and should do wonders for preventing his unfortunate, uh, bodily fluids from staining anything in the wagon. The party all nod in agreement and decide to spend the night here, catching up with Rasmussen about what had happened. Rasmussen says his job over the border had gone quite well, that he believes he had convinced a lot of the men of Polamont that the gnomes of the Papani would be a very ingenious people deserving of diplomatic connections and growing beyond what their slavery past had led them to. But he also tells the tale of some elves he ran into on his way down. It seems Rasmussen was stopped by a hunting party, the kind that stopped people on the road to demand taxes at the most inconvenient time. However, this group was larger than any they had seen or heard of before. Nearly two dozen elves gathered around a lone female figure, riding atop a pure white giant elk. She wore a wooden mask and called herself Nilkia. Rasmussen had had a quick conversation with this elf from this point forward, he would call the princess. He explained that she had been much nicer and more understanding than Leif Feynell, and while she demanded a traveling tax, it had been a couple of paltry coins, and that she had not sought to undermine his pride or station at all. Rasmussen stares back into the woods, thinking about that elven princess, wondering why she had traveled with so many guards, why she wore a strange wooden mask, what the relevance of the name Nilkia could possibly be. In the morning, Pharaoh would place a pair of coins over the dead man's eyes and offer up a silent prayer to her god. As her spell completes, the smell of the corpse begins to dissipate, as he seems to only be almost become more into a rigor mortis like state. The color from his infected death wound fading away. A gentle repose placed upon him. The party packs the corpses into the back of their wagon and begin making their way back to Corella. Another successful adventure under their belt. With some strange magical artifacts in hand. A few corpses to bring back to show that they had found the student, but that she had been dead long before they found her. And many questions about what goes on 
in the authorial forest. And with that, we will be drawing to the end of our day's little story time. A uh, couple of fights, one more intense than the other. A successful gathering, a bit of a argument amongst the party, and the return of Rasmussen Granite Hide. Next, the party will return to the town so that they can turn in their job and find a bit of coin and perhaps discover what it is they must do next. How is everybody doing? What did you think of the story and of the party's current adventures? How would you have reacted to an encounter where you were missing the one damage type? that you would most need. And how do you think the party did with making use of the wisps to kill off the thorns? But most importantly, and because I'm always excited for this type of stuff, what do you all think happened to Hannah and her crew? Why were they caught by the spiders if they had been gathering them from them for weeks? How did she end up burnt to a crisp as a magic user? And what do you believe this wand she created might be able to do? If you don't mind, I'm going to scroll back a little bit and kind of read some of your older comments. I'm sorry, I know I don't get into the comments much when I'm getting into the story, but I just wanted to, to get a few pieces out there and... When I get set into it, I tend to really just want to stick to my descriptions, and I don't like breaking up the energy of it. Let's feed the spooky ghost that led us into an ambush. That can't possibly go wrong. You know, at least if you don't anger them, it should go fine. Oh man. Spooter sounds cute. Oh, everybody loves a good spooter. If one could charm spiders, could a person farm him or herself an army of spiders? Uh, that will come down to a degree. Animal charm spells tend to only last for like an hour or ten hours. And at the end of it, the animal tends to know that it was magically charmed. So charming an army is really hard. I know there's some spells like Animal Friendship or a few others that can get you one or two consistent companions. But for the most part, charming is really a short-term thing that can only be used on a few targets. And so is can make you maybe a temporary squad, but isn't really great for getting yourself a full army up and running. Let's see here. Since some spiders slurp the intestines of their victims like a smoothie, could a corpse become bloated when they're basically empty? So no. So that is why the husk corpse of the man that was in a cocoon was just kind of an empty husk. But the man who was bitten, but made it into the wagon and simply died of the venom, he still had his organs and so was still able to become bloated and sick looking, you know? I probably wouldn't trust someone who's no notes who uh, literally combusted themselves. Yeah, that's fair. It's, it is kind of curious how a wizard could make the mistake of setting themselves on fire. Uh, coins of the uh, on the eyes of the dead. So does this mean Charon also exists in D&D? So actually, two things. Charon does exist, though they're a type of fiend. They're a special type of fiend that exists within... Uh, uh, an area I think called Gehenna, which is uh, kind of the one of the darker evil planes. Uh, however, the coins over the eyes is actually a literal component to the spell called Gentle Repose, which prevents a corpse from going further into death timer, essentially. What this means is it prevents rot, de prevents decay, and also gives you more time for spells like Revivify that can only revive a person if they've only been dead for a minute. If you're able to gentle repose them right away, then you can have a lot more time to prepare what you need to actually revive them. The Wisp fight sounded fun but stressful. Oh yeah, super stressful. Honestly, I was a little terrified when my party was focusing on trying to kill the... Uh, thornies instead of trying to pick off the vine blights but they might get themselves trapped in an infinite loop of the thornies reviving but then they began figuring out the trick that they could use the will of the wisps hunger to finish off the thornies and 
god just then making use of uh trying to figure out where an invisible creature was was super cool during the encounter uh holy shit that was crazy intense yeah agreed love the vivid descriptions thank you blinty boy i try my best nobody had a single torch uh people had torches i think it just came down to the stress of the fight and thinking about trying to take a turn to light up a torch to just do a very small amount of fire damage tends to not feel really good in a moment of combat so it tends to kind of get pushed to the back of the mind on a way to deal with creatures that are reviving themselves is the wand of fireball but instead of going to a target centers on the caster you guys really do not believe in in the power of hannah However, it's definitely not that, because the wand wasn't found on her, so she didn't use it. That wasn't what was used in order to get her, uh, at least get her to attempt to escape from the cocoon. Okay, hear me out. That sounds way too much like an accident. I've played enough Hitman to know that this was a setup. Oh, so you believe the student was set up. But by who? Not many people knew she was out here at all. I mean, any professor could get access, but she didn't give her exact location to anyone. The party was able to learn a general area from both Cynthia, her friend, and the transmutation professor. But those two were also the ones who put up the missing girl noticed, so it would be strange for them to have come out here to try and kill Hannah for some reason only to create a job to go out and find her. But I do like the way you think, Marcia. Very, very sinister. But now then, I believe it is time for us to uh, perhaps begin to move on. Unless there are any further questions or notes anybody has i'm always excited to talk more about kind of how i set up the encounters or what's going on in my world but self-reports are imposter 101 ah so what i'm hearing is you think either cynthia or the professor are sus mm. Mm. what a very thing to think that perhaps the villain is hiding among us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was horrible, I know, but I couldn't help it. But I hope you all enjoyed story time for the evening. I hope I have all of you wondering a little bit of what happened here. But for now, I think it's time we place that all aside. For I have a few fun things planned for today. Two little building sessions I thought would be fun for us to spend an hour just kind of working on. I know people really enjoy encounters, and I know everyone's not super familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, or at least 5th edition. But honestly, some of those ideas that I get for people who aren't super used to the rules, I just love to take and run with. Tortuga really had a rough few sessions, didn't he? First the kids, now the giant spiders. Yeah, no, this was this was definitely a very rough time for Tortuga. And moving forward, for him, things only got a little darker when they returned to Corella. As, for a bit of a spoiler, as they move on ahead, they find hints of the man who killed Tortuga's family. Yeah, I think one of them did it and make it, made it look like an accident so they could get the blueprint she had. If they took it after killing her, it'd look too much like a crime. Oh, okay. So it has to be the person that gets the most chances to take the manuscript afterwards. Well then, we'll just have to see what the party does with this magical artifact and with Hannah's designs. But for now, we have a bit of designing work to do ourselves. As today, the next thing we're going to be doing is a fun little job I call Build a Monster. 
we are going to go on ahead and spend some time designing our own little monster for me to plug into our world. Well, into the campaign at some point. Or maybe something that people would feel interested in taking and using themselves. Honestly, I don't have a monster already planned and in mind that I want to build. I don't have an encounter I'm doing. I just really enjoy making some of this homebrew stuff with you guys. And wanted a chance for us to build our own little monstrosity. So, how does that sound? Are you all ready to help me build a monster from scratch? Deciding drugs? Am I going to be put on DEA watch list after the stream? We'll have to see. Yeah, monster making. All right, all right. Well, then, first things first. I'm going to be starting us off with a little poll. That's right. Monster making is going to have a lot of polls involved with it today, as we have quite a few questions to answer to help us point us in the direction of this thing we're going to be making. And the first question is, where does our monster live? First things first, what type of environment does this monster live in? Is this a cave dweller, a creature of the desert, a monster living in the dark of the forest? Perhaps something stalking an urban environment, either villages, towns, or cities. Or are we going to go far out there and make this something that resides within the ocean. The poll is up and ready. So get your votes in as we begin guiding ourselves to what this monster will be. We should just make a Jerry Totus in D&D. Oh God, carnivorous pigeon swarm. Oh God. Like, I don't know if you know what a Sturge is. I'll go look for that while everybody's doing their votes and all. Let's see. Let's clear out some of these filters so I can try to pull up a Sturge for you to look at. Oh, look at this little dude. So a Sturge is something between a giant bat and a mosquito. Those are some fucked up little buggers that... I've never had a really great chance to use, but I'm still kind of excited about us making something almost as a strange homage to them. Time's up, and what do we have? A tie between Urban and Ocean. Jerry Totus isn't frightening enough. Get a plezzy off and... It's 30 mile hip check. Well then, I suppose we're going to have to build ourselves a creature that can survive in both urban and ocean environments. So land and sea. Mm. Now there are some underwater cities, but those tend to be run by creatures like abolets, uh leviathans krakens just sort of underwater monstrosities so yes this could definitely be a port type monster so let's start up our next poll to begin narrowing this down and that is how let's see here so the how or so urban slash ocean i see a few options of course there's a, a port-like creature. You know, something that lives in the sea, but specifically around ports. It's attracted to either the life, the garbage, what else you could find around a port. But it is something that would live predominantly in the water. Another option, of course, is an amphibian. Amphibian. A creature that can live both on land and the ocean. Oh god, I'm not going to be able to spell amphibian correctly, am I? Amphibian. There we go. And another good option 
Is there a size limit? Or are we going gargantuan? We will go as large as we need. We are making something from scratch. The last option I'm thinking, which can always be fun, is a creature that metamorphs. A creature that maybe has multiple stages or does large transformations. But I think I really like the idea of something that goes through multiple life stages, kind of like an insect. So right now I've got port-like creature, amphibian, or a metamorph. This isn't even my final form. Exactly. So maybe it has like a baby or larval stage in the water and it comes out on land. Or maybe it's the opposite. A monster which stalks the, can the canalized of the given city. Ooh. So a canal-like creature. I think that would still kind of fall under the port. So is there any other way we can think of a creature that works in both urban and ocean? I think I've got one more idea. Hmm. What's the best way to think about this? I suppose it would be a creature that is actually airborne. Liar. Not not a creature that really lives in the water, but more so stalks over the water. So it's comfortable in an ocean environment, like a, a like a seabird, but is able to come over land and the like. Octopuses can walk on land to a degree. To a degree. So I think those are some good options, and we're going to put the poll on up. So how is our creature both urban and ocean? Is this a creature that likes ports or canals? Something that lives in the water but is able to temporarily snatch, grab, or crawl its way onto land to get some prey? Is this a full-fledged amphibian? Something like a frog or other slimy thing that crawls its way onto land when it wishes and back into the water when it needs to is this instead a metamorphosis creature something that goes through different stages and so comes onto land and goes into water during different stages of its life or perhaps is this an airborne creature something that lives over the ocean but returns to land whenever it all right, y'all. Okay. Could could you guys, you guys, we can't, we can't make it all four of these, I don't think. Oh, God. Okay. All right. Nope, nope. Uh, the... I guess the people have voted... So, this is a creature that lives predominantly around ports and canals of cities. It metamorphs, it can go airborne, and it goes amphibious. So, I think we can still work with that. That means it'll have, I think, an ocean stage, an amphibian stage, and then an airborne land stage. Hey, that's more combinable than I would have been. Yeah, yeah, no. An amphibian that, that sprouts wings in its final stage of life? Yeah. So what I'm thinking then is we have a creature that has three official stages. It starts in the ocean, purely water-based, perhaps living predominantly around ports and canals. In the second stage of its life, it becomes amphibious, coming onto land or returning into the water at times. And finally, it can go into sort of its final stage, which lives entirely on land, but can fly. So it has a, a variety of options once it goes into its, its final stages of life. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll have the time to actually fully design, like, in the monster creator this, but we will try to get as much of this down as possible. So let me scroll for a bit. There we go. So, our new monster is urban and 
ocean. It morphs between three stages. So purely oceanic. Um sorry. Um Vibius? Oh, I'm just gonna have to Oh shit, did I actually get that? Damn! I'm good. And and finally kind of a a, a, a flight stage. Okay, okay. Mayfly, strangely fitting. Hmm. Mighty Morphin Power Penguin. Oh god. So it's evolution the monster. Exactly. Maybe something like fish frog seagull. Yeah, kind of like those those sort of ideas. But we'll get into a bit more of those specifics in just a moment. Because we have a very important question to ask ourselves. And that's how intelligent is it? Is this, uh, is it bestial? I think with its ability to uh, metamorph and the like, beast yield does make sense. And I don't want to make it, like, dumber than, than most beasts would be. Is it perhaps more... Hmm, what, what would be a good step above this? So, I guess we we go from beast yield to... What, what would be the intelligence of, like, the monsters that can talk? technically but aren't like intelligent creatures think like the talking mimics i suppose or or something else in that vein not things that make traps or or catching things or try to outsmart them but just sort of that i guess monstrous intelligence Oh dear, I'm sorry, but now that I've created the name Mighty Morphin Power Penguin, I can't support anything else. That's the best idea I've had all week. Ah, primitive. I guess I like that. So primitive. Then we can say human. And after that, aberrant. So the pole is... Ooh, what is this? Content does not meet guidelines. Uh, aberration? Is it aberrant? A uh, beast like. Okay, there we go. Monkey. Some can talk by a sign language. Yeah. So, we got ourselves beast like, primitive, human, and aberration. How intelligent should our being be? I swear to fucking God. I'm going to revoke your guys' polling privilege privileges if you try to force another tie. Because we cannot tie these. These are mutually exclusive. I mean, we can always assign one of these intelligences to each of its life stages. But we're very much coming to the point that you guys are abusing the system to create three different monsters. With, with just some similarities between them. So let's see. Random intelligence at a time. That would be fun. Alright. Well, it looks like we've got a primitive intelligent. A being that can talk, though isn't highly intelligent in any way. So it's primitive. Meaning it can talk. Uh, it can... Plan to a degree and can use basic tools. Nice, nice, nice. There you go. One answer. Thank you, Spring. All right. So we've got a metamorphing creature with some primitive intelligence. Mm. All right. All right. Now then, I've got a very interesting question for us then. The next one in our long series of polls is, how does it fly? I feel like we have quite a few options 
Uh, it might have some inherent magic to it. There are some creatures that have some inherently magical abilities that aren't intelligent. You can look at Displacer bleat Beasts or Blink Dogs. So we might be able to put some into that. But for now, I don't know if that's the right, the right idea. Or maybe it is the question. Can it perform magic? Let's see, there's, uh, yes, any magic. No. No magic. Uh, magic-like abilities. So things like Kelpies, Displacer Beasts, and those that have, like, magical properties to them, but aren't them casting spells. Or... Uh, we're not talking about the flight quite yet. I was thinking of that, but an interesting question about magic came up. And so we're going to go ahead and have these up. Is this a creature with the ability to access the weave? How many legs does it have? All right, Infinity. First time chatter, that'll be the next question that we figure out. Is how many limbs does it have in each stage of its life, perhaps? Or maybe we'll start at the final stage and just sort of remove limbs as we work our way back Ooh, let's see how it goes less intelligence means more instincts all right are we speaking of flight or go nah no magic that thing's already looking kind of stacked agreed though it looks like we might be going to some sort of magic abilities things like mimicry illusions uh stickiness Stuff like that. Venom, petrification, perhaps. Yeah, it looks like magic-like abilities is going to win out here, which is fine. That can always be fun. And now, by request of infinity... Oh, first, let's say it's got magic-like abilities. Oh, no. There we go. Magic-like abilities. Not spells, but... Ooh. Magical properties. We'll figure out what some of those are after we answer the requested question. How many limbs? Okay. So, because of how we're doing this... I want to start with a more specific question than how many limbs does it have. How many limbs does it end with? So in its final stages of its life, how many limbs does it have? We can go with, you know, the basic no limbs at all. Let's see here. Two limbs. Four limbs. I'll say insect limbs or yeah i'm going to leave this as a little bit of a fun last one all right the poll is up how many limbs does this creature end up with does it not have limbs does it get two limbs by the end of its life? Four limbs? Is it more insectoid, having like six, eight, a dozen limbs? Or is this a creature equipped with an ungodly number of tentacles? Something to give it more of that aberrant look. I myself am going to be casting my vote for the insect-like limbs. Somebody mentioned having four different wings, and I really like that idea. So I'm going for that kind of broad number. What are you all feeling? Seems like we've got a lot more interest in the four insect or tentacles than in the no limbs or two limbs. So let's see how it ends up. About to be hentai up near. All right, so the creature ends up with tentacles. Doesn't need to start with them, but it ends up with them. All right, we're definitely feeling rather 
range then. So, I know how this choice ends. Yeah. So then, my friends, we're making a tentacled monstrosity that can fly. So, important question. How does our tentacled creature fly? Uh, is it, it has wings? They're not limbs. So of course it has wings, they're not limbs, that's not what we were thinking about. Uh, it's a glider. It's something that's able to basically catch air on expanded skin slats and the like. Magic, duh. It uses magic to fly, it doesn't need anything else. Ooh, a good classic. Let's give it some inflatable bladders. Let's see here. Tentacles, it flies with the power of magic. No need to explain. All right, all right. I think I got some good options for you. The jet stream of water out of its tentacles. Can its tentacles turn into wings? Maybe. Damn, that's great. Copter tentacles. Alright, well I've got some options. We can of course go with magic, duh. Or this is a glider. He has, you know, flaps or other things to catch the air. He still has wings, wings and tentacles. Or it seems like we're getting some interest in inflatable bladders. A boy who just sort of floats his way through life. I do so like the idea of a guy who's just sort of floating about through his day. However, I'm starting to feel like we're making a flump. I, I don't know how I feel about that. What do you guys think? Are we making a flump? And inflatable bladders have one out, I suppose. All right. All right. Okay. So. Let's think. What's our next little step? In this design. So let's see here. Flies via bladders. All right. I think a good question. That'll help us a little bit more in narrowing down how this creature works is. What's its alignment? Is this a creature that is evil, good, neutral, lawful, or chaotic? I know we'll probably need to come up with some combos here, but I want to see what is it predominantly. Is this a predominantly good or evil creature? Is it predominantly lawful or chaotic or neutral? What is its absolute focus as a being? This guy is way bigger than a flump. You're letting chat create a creature through poles. It was never going to be anything other than a flump. Explain alignment. Well, right now, just uh, a best way to think about it is... Is this a creature that is selfish or selfless? Does it live in the middle of things? Does it believe in holding to its own rules? Or does it react to the moment as the moment occurs? Wouldn't intelligence be part of that? Uh, not exactly. Some very low intelligence creatures still have alignments. It's just a question of selfish or selfless. Believing in its own way of living or living from moment to moment. Looks like the creature is going to be a crackhead. Well, the creature is going to be chaotic, meaning it doesn't hold a personal or long standing code. Interesting. 
Though chaotic does make a sense to its metamorphosis, this is a being that doesn't hold its shape for very long in its life, I think. So it's a being that doesn't believe in other things holding to a set of rules. I like how this guy's turning out. Hell yeah. Mm. Plot twist for creating Eric's new VTuber model. Splinty boy! Don't give it away. All right. So, he can plan to degree and use basic tools. He has no spells, but has some magical properties. He has many exciting tentacles. He flies by a, via bladders, and he is chaotic. So, I suppose the best question for us to figure out are what are its wants in a degree its desires its drive is this creature driven entirely by hunger instinct that sort of thing it floats about looking for food and the like and all it does is incidental mm, it wants to feed it's hungry is it uh, it's a very big force of chaos, so is it more so seeking amusement? Is this a creature that floats about and uses its appendages to cause havoc, in a sense? So, amusement, um, just to cause more chaos. A creature driven by strange interests it does have a primitive intelligence so it could be something that simply floats about in that manner hmm. there's some other good idea you could make it wants to to be clean like a neat freak flying spaghetti monster hungry for something unconventional strong emotions chaos yeah and i think we'll figure out what it hungers for if we go for the the hunger as being its drive let's see here another popular one is fear is this idea of fear driving it think beholders they're driven almost entirely by fear concern so this is going to be fear or or i guess mm, defense no uh fear i'll simply leave um let's hear Beat Freak could mean soap bubble magical abilities, which could be interesting. Or, I guess we're having a lot of fun with this. Is it uh, just trying to do good? Is it trying to just clean up the world around it? Trying to, trying to help people in whatever ways its powers allow it to? Is this the Neat Freak? Let's hear. How does it reproduce? This is a huge drive for really strange behavior in real life and nature. That's, that's true. That is true, though. We'll kind of see what we like. Does it want to have slaves? Perhaps, perhaps. But it looks like, I don't know, we're getting very split between the amusement and chaos and it trying to do good. So, do we have ourselves in a uh, malicious prankster? Or a diddly do good? Oh, God. You guys aren't going to split me between do-gooder and a chaos bringer, are you? Ah, uh, chaotic neat. Oh my lord, what have you all done to me? Fine, fine, fine. What its wants are can be defined as chaotic neat. Gods above, you all are crazy. It will be good at all costs. All right. So we've got a floating tentacle boy that cleans up things and causes chaos. So it does good in a very chaotic sense, of course, of course. So we've got a chaotic good creature, then. 
hoping in the long run. That's right. That's right. This gets better every poll. I know. I know. All right. So it does pranks and it wants to clean things. So I think the things it's going to be pranking are going to be evils in some way. Obviously, right? So who are its victims? Hmm, a very interesting question. Perhaps liars. Perhaps nobility. The players? Okay, I mean, obviously, but you know. A very sloppy traveler. It claims that its idea of clean is vastly different than everything else. It attempts to prank for an inconvenience, but it turns out helpful in the end. It really likes the bucket over in the jar door. <laughs> Let's hear everyone. Fine, that could definitely be an everyone. Um, I guess guilt ridden can be fun. A fun idea. Butchers because it doesn't like them killing animals. Okay. Something really specific I like. Any other ideas? I want one more option up here, but I want it to be something super specific. Help me think of something that's a really, like, this thing just finds these targets magically but it's something super specific something it's going to prank because of its chaotic nature but also it's kind of good cleanliness nature it wants to see others try to be good and fail oh so those seeking redemption hey yo first time on stream hey how's it going upgrade well, if it wants to kill this one guy, but it doesn't know where he is, it hates fishermen for kidnapping its friends and family while it while it was younger. People holding messy food. Alright, you know what? I like fishermen. So, fishermen. Those seeking redemption. Everyone. The guilt-ridden. Something blobby from Hotel Transylvania, like how it's eternally trash inside it. Pretty good. Dealing with final exams and also tweaking my homebrew subclasses. Oh, shit, Upgrade. Well, if you ever want me local wizard, you know? Magically inclined. I like it. Well, Upgrade, if you want, I always encourage people who come into my streams, if you ever want to ever chat about your homebrew stuff, get more eyes on it, get some reactions, I'm always willing to be open to anyone sending me private messages or whispers, and I'll always respond to questions about your homebrew, my homebrew, how I go about it, how I like to balance it. Or if you'd like, and I'm very open to this, and we can vote on it at the end of the stream, I can also have any of your stuff on stream sometime in the future, and you can see what everyone, people familiar with D&D, people not in like the know of it we're just reacting to it broadly think and i could do just a whole stream about talking about what your current design is what people think and what i might do what i like or what might not work for what your design currently is sure i could drop you some homebrewy links hell yeah i would like some help on it all right so make sure you send that to me fisherman gosh dang y'all so let's see it was fisherman at four guilt ridden at two well, it seems like we're going for, uh, I got three sub -glo Hell yeah, upgrade. I'll take a look at those. And if you ever want, feel free to check out my archive on YouTube. I have some old, uh, VODs that I've posted up there that kind of go over some of my homebrewed. Oh God. Oh geez. Bad test. Got to get that off this page. Uh, basically, some of my old homebrew uh, races and classes that I made, how I went about them, and just kind of the current state that they sit in. All right. So it likes to prank fishermen. Okay. All right, y'all. 
Now, we will definitely come back to this little creature. But we have one more job that we got to do this evening, and it's one more set of designs. We'll definitely come back and finish up our little build-a-monster, and probably next week's stream if I have enough time on it. But for now, I've got to move on to our last real job today, which is designing drugs. Can this thing be terribly afraid of bugs? Hell yeah, it can. But for now, we've got to leave him be. Leave our little metamorphing, tentacle floaty prankster boy to, to his own devices for a little bit. Because for the final stages of today, I want to see if we could spend a little bit of time designing some fantasy magical drugs. Now, you might be wondering why this is a place I'm excited to go. But that's simply because I've already introduced a few in my current world, and I like the idea of expanding outward even more from these. So, for the last 20 minutes or so of stream, we're going to be having a lot of fun. I just noticed we haven't been visited by the bot today. No, we haven't. Oh, well. Hmm, unfortunately, I guess we don't get to become famous. All right, but, 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 if I could get everybody's attention, refocus. Do you play D&D &D with friends? Yes, I do. I'm actually currently running a campaign. Uh, basically, I'd homebrewed a world where I made 72 unique countries. Uh, I've got some lore videos up on my archive about that. And I've just been sort of having streams where I tell stories about what my can how my campaign's going, things that happened in it. I talk about how I homebrew countries, how I make lore, how I make magic items and the like, and just everything I've done. If you want to catch any of that, I have all of my VODs archived up on YouTube. You can do the uh, hotkey for archive if you want to see that and check any of my past stuff out. And I encourage you to, especially if you're interested in how I go about designing stuff and what kind of I'm doing with these D&D streams. Whispered you the three subclasses I made. You're free to show them whenever you're, if you wish. Okay, upgrade. If you could just make sure to message me. Do you have a preference? I'm good to just do this in private, but if you'd really like more eyes on it, more broad reactions to it, then instead of giving you anything like over the week, I'll wait until next weekend and I'll just make your, your shit kind of the focus of a stream so that we can have some time. I would like chat's opinion on it too. Okay, okay, upgrade. Then I'll go ahead and I'll get myself prepped over the week to have a little bit of show, tell, and design notes next Saturday. And that, I think, is going to be super exciting. But for now, we're going to do a quick run over of the three drugs I've made so far so that you can have an understanding of kind of where I'm approaching the magical drugs in my world. The first boy we're going to be taking a look at is Ludden, a specialized type of leaf that is smoked by those who need just a little extra boost in the middle of their day. After you take Ludden, you gain the benefits of a short rest, meaning you can regain some features that you've used, maybe a little bit of health, who knows, if you can imagine in the middle of the fight taking a couple of rounds out of your time to light up a stick of Ludden and get it lit, especially with a class that regains a lot of their features after a short rest, you could see how this drug could immediately turn a fight. However, you are then immediately affected by Ludden High for one hour. While affected, you can choose one exhaustion effect to ignore. Ludden is meant to be a bit of an upper, so being able to ignore one effect of exhaustion can be very helpful. However, oh, and if you take a short rest for the duration of this hour, you may instead benefit from a long rest after only one hour of resting. Of course, you do not regain hit die. You can still heal where those hit die are spent. Also, 
you won't be able to benefit from another long rest for 24 hours. But if you fall unconscious while under the effects of a Ludden High, you are unconscious for one hour, at the end of which But, as people are filtering back in. So, here you can see the idea for Ludden is to be something that, like, a warlock or a monk can make great use of in the middle of a fight. But it comes with, number one, all of my drugs have a potential loss condition, essentially, where if you get dropped or if something bad happens while you're under its effect, it becomes much worse. Secondly, they all have a point of exhaustion and a negative. Basically, this is a way to kind of how I build my drugs is the idea of there's a loss condition if things go horrible, just so players going in know what they really need to avoid if they're going to be playing with these drugs. And then also just the general negative that will hit them, which will always be exhaustion and another negative. Ludden, as you can see, can be very powerful if you're using it, but if you don't have a way to consistently get rid of the exhaustion, it'll start stacking on you. It becomes very dangerous to use. Next, we have Orbamead, where you are affected by it for 10 minutes. While you're effective, you have expertise in all int and wisdom skills. Orbmead is a dark blue potion something that can be drunk to grant you serious intelligence and memory boosts but while you're infected your initiative is decreased by five your movement speed is decreased by 10 to a minimum of five there's not currently an addiction mechanic which is why all of them come with some very useful bonuses uh, i might end up someday making an addiction mechanic but for now i simply want the upside of the drugs to hold enough power to pull a player to using them. You may choose to fall unconscious at any time while you're affected by Orb Mead. If you fall unconscious while affected, you must make a DC 15 wisdom check. On a fail, you take 3d6 psychic damage and fall unconscious for one hour, during which time you will relive a random memory from your past in perfect detail this will often be tied to strong emotions on a successful save you take half that damage and can select the memory you wish to recollect in perfect detail at the end of this time you gain one point of exhaustion orb mead is something that can be very useful for out of combat scenarios its negatives will hit you immediately if you're going to be going into combat anytime soon. No movement, no initiative, makes it very hard to play around unless you're more of a, a casting or range focus, but even then those can be pretty punishing. The expertise and int and wisdom tell you what this is all about. This is about the out of combat intelligence memory sense boosting effect that the potion has, as well as its ability to give you perfect memory for anything in your past. Though this is where the lose condition comes in. For anybody facing this wisdom check, they can fall to the DM's ire, where you can inflict on your player their character's worst memory. Though to be fair, this item is much more fun in narrative than Ludden is. If you have a player who is using Orb Mead, you get to have a lot of fun going into telling them their memories, having their backstory laid out to other players, and doing it through this really emotional, like, uncontrollable fashion. The final drug I have is Zolflex, the most magical of them all. I thought of one, it's the tentacle of the monsters prepped correctly. One has plus 10 strength for three turns and is highly addictive. Eating too much is highly toxic. Oh, we're going to make a drug out of our little flump boy. Okay. But with Zolflex, you're 
you're affected by Zolhai for one minute. While affected, all cantrips can be cast for a bonus action. This alone makes Zolflex very potent. This allows players to consistently cast two spells a turn, comboing off either two cantrips or a cantrip and an action spell. Tentacle milk. Oh, God. While effective, whenever you use a spell slot to cast a known spell, you may choose to treat that slot as if it was one spell level higher. The spell must be known to you, and the initial spell slot used must be of high enough level to have cast the spell without this effect. Whenever you cast a spell, the target saves. You may make them roll 2d4 and subtract that from their saving throw. This makes your spells very powerful and almost guaranteed to hit. Whenever you cast a spell, though, you take a DC 15 constitution save. On a fail, you take 1d6 necrotic damage per spell level, with cantrips dealing an automatic 1 necrotic damage. Your spells are powerful, and you can cast a lot of them very easily, but they will chip away at your health very quickly. And as most of the casting classes in D&D start with a rather small health pool, this can go wrong very quickly. Because if you fall unconscious while affected, you're unconscious for one hour, at the end of which you gain one exhaustion and lose all remaining spell slots. You cannot regain spell slots until after your next long rest, meaning you have a long rest to recover, plus you would need a long rest to normally regain spells. If you are reduced to zero hit points by any of this drug's damage sources, you are afflicted with the disease Zol Plague. Whenever the afflicted casts a spell, they must make a con save of 15, and on a fail, they take 1d6 necrotic damage per spell level and lose an additional spell slot of their choice. 1d6 damage is not a lot on its own, but if you're casting just even a second level spell, that's 2d6 damage. If you're casting a third level spell, 3d6. And as this has the ability to push all of your spells up a level, you are almost always going to be taking 3d6 or more damage when you're casting real spells, which will eat away at your health very quickly as a caster. A lot of 5th level casters, which is where you get access to 3rd level spells, have around 30 health. So if they're casting a 3rd level spell, that's 3d6, which on average is going to be, what, 9 damage? Which means they have about 3, 4 uses before they're going to be killing themselves. And since cantrips are also going to be dealing one damage, and this thing encourages you to cast two spells a turn, that means you're going to have two to three turns before this is likely to be killing a wizard. So as you can see, this is my most potent, powerful, and dangerous drug. But now... We're going to be building one together. So. Let us see what you all think. What sort of drug should we make? Something smoked? Eaten? Ingested? Something more sinisterly applied? Is this like a Ludden? A drug that affects you physically? Like Orb Mead? Mentally, or like Zolflex, magically. In fact, that seems like the perfect question. What 
type of drug? Is this a physical? Mental? Or magical drug? What does it affect, cause, or grant? More magic? More physical prowess? Or more mental abilities? Let us see. Yeah, Ludden has the effect of a short rest, so Warlocks uh, get all their stuff back. I allow them to Nova twice in one fight. Hell yeah, no. Like I said, Ludden is very potent for characters who are short rest based. It does start stacking up the exhaustion very quickly, though. And a thing for people who aren't familiar, at six points of exhaustion, a character instantly dies. After your first point of exhaustion, you start getting disadvantage. After somewhere down the third line, you start moving slower, healing less. It's a stacking negative buff that you can only get rid of by doing a long rest. But a long rest only removes one point of exhaustion. So if you earn yourself multiple points of exhaustion over the course of a fight, you're either going to need to take a few days off of doing anything. Oh, okay. So it looks like we have a physical drug. Very good. Very, very good. All right. So a drug that'll affect people physically, granting them strength, energy, life. Why do the people take this drug? Hmm. All right. In fact, I want to word it more in that way. So why is this a popular no so what type of drug is this an upper is this a downer is this something that's going to grant you energy is this something that's going to relax you help you ignore pain or what is a good third option? Total pain resistance, increasing con. Two rounds, two rounds with an instant exhaustion level. Uh, what is what is a really good third option? So an upper, a downer. I don't think a hallucinogen would quite work for a physical drug. No, no, no. What else? What else? What is the world we could live in here? Oh, I know what i do. I'll call it a mutagen. So, is this something that's going to grant you more energy? Is this an upper that gives you excited, gives you back abilities, gives you extra actions on a turn, extra speed, perhaps? Is this a downer? Does this allow you to ignore pain, allow you to relax, allow things to roll off of you. Oh yeah, an increasing jumping distance does exist, Marcial. Or is this a mutagen? We talked about physical, so maybe this grants you some interesting mutations temporarily. The feet or claws of a monster, the eyes that can pierce into the darkness, this is something that wholly mutates what you are, changes you to grant you some new ability. And it looks like the mutagen is about tentacles are back as an option. God damn it. You guys are just trying to make everything tentacles. Mm, temporal tentacles. God, just quantum tentacles everything is and always will be tentacle tentacles theory god damn it okay okay but we want a mutagen mm -hmm. all right well what's are some of the things we want to see mutated i saw movement as a definite option someone was interested in so what is the effect 
So I saw there was a change to movement, whether that's jumping or moving quicker. Uh, doesn't really move the net. There we go. Uh, is this resistance? Is this something that grants you armor or protection from something? Where there is a will, there is a way, especially in tentacles. Effect movement, it could give tentacles. God damn it. You guys just want it to spawn tentacles, don't you? We could definitely do that as a negative effect, but I don't know if, if that's what we want for a positive effect, you know? Though, well, maybe we do, maybe we do. So movement, resistance, attacks. Is this going to grant them claws or some sort of other weapon through the mutation that will allow them to do more attacking? Or... Hmm. <laughs> Big tentacle on his back, which could propel a person. Okay, okay. Or the final idea for a mutage. Would be appearance-based. It's entirely based around changing your appearance. Whether that's to make you more charming, more intimidating, or something else. It's more meant in social situations to increase or decrease your intrigue to others. Tentacle movement, like Doc Ock. Okay, okay. Well, if you guys want want to make use of some tentacles, I don't know if the appearance is going to be the greatest option, but we'll see what we can do. Don't forget to vote. We got the poll up and running, so let's see what people like. Mm. In fact, I'm starting to get a very... I'm trying to break away from tentacles. <laughs> I'm afraid, Spring, you have the whole group working against you. And it looks like what we have is movement, which I like. Movement wins. In Numera, there was some kind of stuff that was applied correctly had a regen effect not caused a finger like growth on your skin all right guys i think i have an idea for what we are making and i want to call it basically the adaptive salve what this is what i'm imagining based on everything you've been saying is a type of topical drug that is rubbed into your skin a salve that is absorbed into your blood it allows you to adapt to the situation you're in basically you will gain swim speed yes yeah, so you're going to gain swim speed climb speed fly speed and we'll we'll definitely look into how much of this we're doing but due to my lost time i'm gonna have to rush through some of this fly speed and what is that crawl dig speed whatever it is but basically this is something that allows your body to adapt immediately to the environment and the wishes you have granting you swim speed climb speed fly speed dig speed basically the ability to adapt immediately to the environment you're in however obviously those adaptations can be rather dangerous wouldn't you say hmm. other things we can consider is just Movement speed. Let's see here. Uh, jump speed or jump distance. And finally, opportunity attacks. I don't think we want to do all of these, but 
Uh, this is kind of what my last question is. Is this the flump? So, God! Ooze time. Yes, yes, yes. I think you all are starting to see where I'm going with the negative. However, we've got one more. Well, that ties wonderfully to the concept of the jug is harvested or milk from tentacle monsters. Since it's all about evolution as well. Yeah, I think this might be something we can harvest from our own little custom flumps that allow people to adapt immediately to their environment. However, I need to know what is the final bonus. You can move faster. You can jump further. You can react quicker. Or you can ignore... No, I think ignoring difficult terrain should already be included in just kind of that basic adaptation. So I'm going back going to include that. Ignore terrain. You gain tentacles that add an extra attack. Ooh. Yeah, so the salve, I think, is going to react to quote-unquote the environment and to your wishes. So faster, but your disadvantage on deck saves. Okay. For now, I think we're only going to finish up the positives of this drug. But at the beginning of our next stream, I'll show you what shape I have bent it into. But let's see. We can move faster, jump further, react quicker... Or, I suppose, attack faster. So, this move faster, jump further. Hmm. I guess speed, jump, reaction and attack here we go start that pull this pole is already active oh god did you guys get a pull okay cool you guys got a pull nice 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 negative would be that you grow a tentacle that hits you at random and intervals okay maybe one elemental resistance based on situation now that's doing quite a lot at that point i think we're already giving it quite a lot of movement options so i'm going to try to keep it almost entirely within the kind of movement and agility field and not get a ton of so move faster react quicker okay okay so it looks like we're going to be going for movement speed And opportunity attack, ignoring. Very, very powerful. All right, and I'll note it down. So we 100% want one of the negatives to have something to do with tentacles, is what I'm gathering. Let me hear some other ideas for negatives that you guys want to see with this drug. When you have applied this adaptive salve, what are some things you could imagine could be some serious negative effects that could happen to someone either if they fall unconscious while it has been applied to them or other causes of negative effects the shape it move faster but a disadvantage on tech saves because you're not a... okay so tentacles disadvantage Due to shifting. Okay. What else? What else are you thinking? Is this a cell maybe a leprosy like effect? The tentacle monster will be attracted to oh, Okay, I'm keeping that. You attract our monster. A hundred percent. A leprosy-like effect. Hmm, okay. So maybe losing maximum health. Not permanently, of course. Uh, long rest or two long rests. We'll, we'll, we'll think about that. An idea of something that kind of degrades you to a degree. 
Any other last ideas? Yeah, the monster targets fishermen and people who have applied the salve. Hmm. Okay, and I think I have one more backlash effect that I really like. Vomiting and random mutations like that one hand mutates for an extended time so that you can only use one-handed weapons. Okay, that's a little interesting. Losing a hand. But the final one I want to put up there is a uh, re basically the a backlash, which is you gain one random vulnerability now you know that'd be fire poison electricity or what is that thunder or whatever it's called but the idea that after the end of it you gain a vulnerability to a damage type picked at random i'll create the chart and just roll a die after someone's taken the drug but just sort of your body is used up all of its adaptive shit. What do you guys think? A uh, backlash vulnerability. Your skin being left a little bit more sensitive to some elements of the world. Whether that's cold, heat, poison, or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think we have a lot of good ideas written down. Both for our fun little tentacle boy and for the drug milked from him or maybe made from the eggs of his. Does the person know what vulnerability they get afflicted with? I think I would say in the realistic sense they probably wouldn't. But also I think me as a DM would just announce what has been rolled just to kind of get the effect across that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you've gained vulnerability to fire because of what you did. Feels a lot better than saying, you gained a vulnerability to something. Bum, bum, bum. But anyways, due to me losing connection, I have run myself a little over time to make sure we could at least get this far. So I'm afraid we're going to be having... To call it an evening for now. I'm super excited to finish up making this adaptive salve to show you what the final form I come up with is. And for us to be spending a bit of time next stream. Oh, it should be based on what adaptations were used. Okay, okay. That would make sense. I'll definitely try to see if there's a good way to use that. But... I think we already know what we're doing next stream. Next stream, we're going to be spending a bit of time finishing up our monster. Turning him into the most adorable little prankster that has ever existed. Who just gently floats through the breeze, pranking fishermen and those who use the adaptive salve. But then also, we've got ourselves a little specialty happening. We've got one of the chat has just DM'd me a few of their own homebrew subclasses. And so that is the other thing we're going to be doing next time when we talk D&D, is looking over someone else's homebrew. I'll be kind of giving my opinions and looking for you guys to say what you think, what really works about his designs, what doesn't, and how best we can help bring out the desired effect of someone else's homebrew. I'm really excited to finally have a chance to be kind of building this type of stuff on stream with you all. And I hope all of you are just excited as I am. But with that, I'm afraid I must wish you all a good night and simply say, I hope to see you again next weekend as we finish up and help out one of you. I'm glad you had fun, Infinity. And good night to you, V the Sleepy Bunny. 
see you all later.